We're turning to Mark chapter 9 tonight, Mark chapter 9 and verse 32, where we continue our study, the necessity of Christ's sufferings is our topic tonight. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid, and he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. One thing that is clear from the scriptures, and both from the Old Testament prophets, and from the gospel records, as well as the epistles, is that Christ was not a victim. He was not a martyr. Christ's death in behalf of sinners and in our place was planned from eternity past by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He was not killed because of the will of men. In fact, he made it absolutely clear that he laid down his life and that he would take it up again. He declared in John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. You see how clear our Lord is. No one is taking my life. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. Only God can do that. These are words of declaring his, his deity. No one, someone may lay down their life, but they don't have the power to take it up again. Only God can do that. This commandment have I received of my Father. The most beautiful and poetic description of our Lord's sufferings is found in the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of seven centuries before our Lord's actual crucifixion, beginning, if you'll turn back with me to Isaiah 52, some often refer to the, the Puritan writers refer to Isaiah as the fifth gospel, because there's so much of our Lord concerning his coming to earth and his passion. And we'll begin there in verse 13 of Isaiah 52, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at, his, at the, his visage, his face, was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of man. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall consider. But who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a, dry, a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we see, shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of me and a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep. Before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And he goes on to tell, look in verse 10. He, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, 
and shall be satisfied. The word propitiation he is the propitiation for our sin, the satisfaction, the payment for our sin. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Surely this could be referring to no one but Messiah, the Son of God, the second member of the Godhead. So specific, so graphic, the description of Calvary seven centuries before the event. You'll recall that the angel told Joseph that Mary would bear a son and that he would be called Jesus for he would bear, he would bear the, the uh, he would save his people from their sin. And that would be a sin offering, a, a sacrifice. This is not news. This is not um, of, of late. This is not because of the political climate of the day. This is not because of Jesus saying things that, that uh, the authorities didn't want to hear, although they were incensed by those things. But please never read the gospel accounts and think that this is some accident or something that caught God off guard or that Jesus was a, a victim, uh, a political uh, you know, martyr. Nothing of the kind. This was the determined plan of God for the redemption of man. Matthew's account, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, those who tell the same, primarily the same record, Matthew tells us the Son of Man shall be betrayed. So he adds that part, that there would be a betrayal. Uh, and he, Jesus told his disciples there, Judas is one, hearing, knowing, I shall be betrayed into the chief priest and into the scribes. Matthew also records that Jesus' death would specifically be by crucifixion, the Roman method of execution. Luke writes, All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Luke also adds of the disciples accompanying Jesus, and they understood or comprehended none of these things. That's the most amazing part of it all. Their lack of comprehending what Jesus was saying and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Three different times in these so-called synoptic gospels, Jesus goes over these same specifics about his coming death. It goes over their heads. And partially, of course, because uh, they did not want to hear it. Sometimes we only hear what we want to hear, even if, even if we're hearing the opposite. The words are coming toward us, but we're somehow transforming them in our thinking and our brain to mean something else. Our Lord was born to this end, and he knew the Old Testament perfectly because he was the living word and because he was the second member of the Godhead. He has perfect and complete knowledge of all truths. Our text can be divided tonight into two headings, our Lord's prediction of his sufferings and secondly, the disciples' puzzlement over his prophecy the lord and the 12 are on the highway to jerusalem a place where many of the prophets had been stoned in response to their own ministry their own god-given messages they i think sometimes when we read the prophets we may not fully appreciate their task they were given messages directly by the lord that nobody wanted to hear and very few ever received, there was always an immediate connotation or interpretation of the prophets, prophecy, and most all the prophets have a future yet fulfilled part to their prophesying. And that rarely were they received. Many of the prophets were stoned. That's how they were welcomed, how, they were, how receptive they were of their, their messages in, in response to their God-given message. How would you like to be told, go preach this message, by the way, you're going to be stoned because of it, but go give it anyway. And the bride of the Hebrews tells us and recounts that many of them, what they suffered because of their ministry. We suffer so little for serving the Lord. So little, little of us who minister in his stead as preachers and teachers and missionaries suffer so little compared to the Old Testament prophets. Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus Christ, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. That's how he addressed Jerusalem. You're the murderer of the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. 
Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He's headed to a snake pit. He's headed to a den of hungry lions, and he knows it. You'll notice in the scripture, Jerusalem is always referred to as up. It is done that way in, in a spiritual connotation, but also geographically, it was up. It stood situated on the highest point of a backbone ridge of hills that run north and south between uh, Jordan, the Jordan and the Great Sea in Palestine. It was the highest point. It was no accident, again, that that was the city of God. That's on the highest point of Jerusalem was built the temple. The city cannot be approached from any direction without an ascent, without going up to it. And as one has noted, it was appropriate that one should be conscious of putting his feet on higher ground when approaching a place like that, the city of the great king, as Jerusalem is called. Now, already in our study of the, the gospel of Mark, this is the third time that our Lord has alluded to, not just alluded to, quite frankly told them that he's going to be killed. He had mentioned them at this event at Caesarea Philippi. After Peter's confession, remember when he said, Who do men say that I am? And they said, Some say you're Elijah, Elijah, Elijah and Elias, and uh, John the Baptist resurrected. And then Jesus pointedly said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter gave that great confession. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right then he told them, in chapter 9, verse 31, he had mentioned them again on the way from the, the Mount of Transfiguration, these events. He will, for the last time, tell it in just a few verses in chapter 10, verse 45, where he says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So this is clear, and they're just not hearing it. I was thinking as I was studying that, how often do we not hear what the Scripture is saying to us, what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us, even while reading it, even while our eyes are going over the words, and we don't receive the greater connotation of what the Scripture is saying. I want us to consider, first of all, the disciples' puzzlement at our Lord's prophecy. Verse 32, look there again, tells us they were amazed, and they were, were afraid, an amazement to the point of being afraid. Now, the fear, I'm sure, is due to their close association with him. They know that if these words are true, that perhaps they will be called out with him or taken with him, killed with him. And so we can imagine, we can appreciate their fear. And not only that, for three years, they had been with him and dependent upon him, having left their homes Having left their businesses, they were solely, had given themselves over to the ministry of the Lord to minister to him and for him, what would happen? If a kingdom was not about to be set up, which they were fully expecting to be ambassadors and emissaries and, you know, people of note in that kingdom, if that's not on the table, what is? Do we go back to fishing and Matthew couldn't, after his conversion, couldn't go back to tax collecting, could he? I mean... What kind of, that, that's unthinkable. And so the thoughts are s s swirling in their minds. They don't want their, their Lord and their closest friend to die. And yet, if, if that's true, if he's going to be killed, what of them? Our Lord goes before them. If you'll picture, they were going uh, to Jerusalem to observe Passover. And the pilgrims would travel together. There was no other way to travel except on foot. I, I guess if you had a donkey or something, some people may have had been riding something. But the masses were commanded to go to observe to three feasts a year. And this was one of them. And so the roads leading up to Jerusalem would be filled with people. And so we picture our Lord going before his disciples. They're the disciples pondering these things. Groups of people have, 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 have joined themselves to them. So there's a, a group of people. Our Lord uh, is away walking ahead of them to be alone and to reflect. And he pauses, calls the disciples to him, and just 
exposes, again, lays this out before them about what's going to happen at Jerusalem. And of course, verse 32 tells us they were amazed and they were afraid. He goes before them. That was often his practice. The, the, the Greek here insinuates that he often walked alone or apart from them just to reflect, to, no doubt to pray, to commune with his father. And uh, just, you can imagine, Jesus had so very little time to himself, so little time without caring for, dealing with the disciples. And by this time, he, he's been inundated with people that needed to be healed and delivered. He is physically exhausted from all this. And then they're making this trip to Jerusalem. The shepherd leading his sheep. What a beautiful and poignant picture that is. We can see the disciples following along, their heads together, them talking with one another. And our Lord above them, several feet or yards ahead of them. And then he pauses. He turns around, calls them to himself, and gives them these words. There were others too, as I've mentioned, travelers and pilgrims making their way to Jerusalem in caravans. One commentator notes, the crowd who usually hung upon the Lord's disciples or footsteps or his fellow travelers on their way to the Passover were conscious of a vague fear. There was this feeling in the air, a moroseness or a, an unsettlement about it all, and they, they sensed it. These feelings must have been awakened by the manner of Jesus. And we can imagine our Lord is 100% God, but he's 100% man as well. He doesn't have a sin nature, but his body feels just like ours does. The weight, the sadness, the emotions, none of those were lost upon him. And humanly speaking, he knows what he's going to face at Jerusalem, knowing he's going to be spit upon, beaten, falsely accused, his beard plucked out, beaten, he says scourged here, and then ultimately crucified. I mean, th that weight, which is nearing, the event is nearing, nearing, nearing. And so I think that they sense this heaviness upon him, and there's a pall, if you will, and the others are sensing it as well. Our Lord walks alone by preference, step and, and gesture revealing what was working within and inspiring awe, someone has written. I think they are expecting him to say something. There's this air about him of expectancy. He waits some morning, moments for the 12 to catch up with him, and then he reveals to them what lies ahead, and, and them as well. He's preparing them for what's before them as well. Uh, in Isaiah 50, verse 7 says of him, The Lord God will help me, Therefore shall I not be confounded. I, therefore have I set my face like a flint. I know that I shall not be ashamed. Jesus is going to accomplish what he came to earth to do. And nothing, not even the weight of it, the pain, the agony, the sadness, or anything is going to stop. Even his disciples' pleadings, as much as he loves them, is not going to deter him. Well, another commentator has noted, we must try to understand the bewilderment and the fear of his followers. For this was a difficult experience for them as well. They're, they're, they're losing hope and faith. They joined on, if you will. Yes, they were called by the Lord, and they were convinced he was the Messiah. But the first thing that came to the, the people when they thought about the Messiah was not Isaiah 53, but the ruling and reigning Christ. A kingdom being established. And they so despised the Roman domination over them. It, it slapped them in the face every day. It was repulsive for a theocracy. Such as Israel was to be. To have the pagan Romans there. The military presence. The Roman soldiers could command them to carry their bags for a mile from the city center. And they, they were under somewhat house arrest if you will. The, the authority of the Sanhedrin did not have its full sway as it did in the Old Testament days because they had to answer to the Roman domination. They were taxed heavily by Rome to pay for the armies and the roads that Rome built and the aqueducts and all the vast building programs of Rome. They hated everything about it. And every Jew knew, and, and 
cradled in their heart the fact that Messiah would come and right every wrong and set up his kingdom and would rule the world. We look forward to that. And so we know that, that how they expectant they were. And when they hear that he's going to die and be crucified, they can't, they can't reconcile the two. It, it doesn't fit. It's, it's opposite to what they have in mind. And so they had not planned on this. They, they'd heard it, yes. We hear things over and over again that we kind of put aside and hope it doesn't take place or pretend like it's not going to. And each announcement of his death only added to their perplexity. And uh, they were absolutely bewildered. What about the kingdom? How is that going to fit in? And hadn't that been promised and prophesied as well? They could not reconcile these two events in their thinking or the timeline. And we can imagine, we can appreciate that. We wouldn't have been able to either. They knew the scripture. Here was the Savior. They were convinced he was the Messiah. If he dies, what were they going to do? So we see the, our Lord's prediction of his sufferings and the disciples' response. Secondly, I want us to consider the prediction itself of his suffering. Where? In Jerusalem. That's where it would take place. Who? The chief priests and the scribes who ought to have known better. These men, the religious leaders of, of uh, Judaism, who were steeped in the scriptures, who could quote it, who had it memorized, absolutely all but a handful, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, Simeon and Anna, just a handful of people received the truth of the Messiah. The chief priests did not, and the scribes did not. What? They shall condemn him to death in a fake sham trial with hired um, you know, witnesses and distorted claims. They will crucify or demand the death penalty on blasphemy. And it hinged on him saying, remember, he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Right over their head. He was not speaking of Herod's enlarged and beautified temple there before them. In the Jewish mindset, which was absolutely apostate at this time and legalistic, they, the worst thing you could do was to swear by the temple or the gold on the temple. It was covered in gold. And when you mention the temple, as the Lord did, or they thought he was referring to the temple, they called that blasphemy. And that will be the charges for his death, that he said he would destroy the temple and raise it back up in three days. How dare him? It was a technicality. They knew he wasn't meaning that but that's the grounds that will be the the charges that will be leveled against him they will mock him they will beat him they will spit on him they will kill him in the third day he will rise again now to be that's the prophecy that's what he tells his disciples it's very plain it's very simple it's gruesome there's not a whole lot of explanation to it he just declares he's forewarning them about what's going to take place. To be clear, these disciples were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. These men were well versed in the Bible. They had heard it all their lives. They'd been to synagogue. All of them knew of the prophecies concerning Messiah. But because of the rabbi's teaching or lack of it or improper interpretation, like so many people who sit in churches all the time, they'll hear, I never heard that doctrine taught before because someone has absolutely gone around it or ignored it or pretended like it was not in the scripture. And so the rabbis did not emphasize the suffering of Messiah. They would emphasize the coming of the kingdom, the establishing of the kingdom, but the unsavory part of a suffering savior was lost on them. And remember that the rabbi put on the same level of scripture, the rabbinical writings, the commentaries of rabbis that went before them. And so that is what they heavily drew from and spoke about. And so they, they didn't have a true understanding of these prophecies themselves. So many people say, well, my pastor doesn't preach on this or that. And it's because obviously he either has a bias. If you do not preach the whole counsel of God's word or he doesn't understand it himself. And that may, may be the case here. As one commentator noted, throughout his ministry, Jesus had challenged 
the rabbinic misinterpretation of the scriptures. He, he constantly corrected their wrong interpretations. When you read in the scripture where Jesus says, you have heard of old time, but I tell you, he is dismantling a wrong interpretation of rabbinic teaching. He's not disclaiming the word of God. He is taking apart what the rabbis had taught about the word of God in which the people put on the same level of scripture. And just keep that in mind. Your father said, he's speaking of the rabbis, their teachers. Your fathers have said, but I tell you, he is the word made flesh. It is his word. He has every right to tell us what it means and to interpret it as he does. For one thing, the Old Testament sacrificial system ordained by God in Leviticus and Exodus and Leviticus and given in the Old Testament, every bit of it pointed to a, a final sacrifice. The regularity and the, the continual offering of the bullocks and the lambs and the goats and the, the burnt offerings and the blood offerings and the, the, meat, the, the meal offerings and the, the drink offerings and on and on, every one of those pointed to one event, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God at Calvary. Every board, every piece of furniture, every stitch, every cloth, every vessel in the tabernacle and later the temple pointed to the person and work of Jesus Christ. It pointed to something about Christ. And that had been lost as well. The temple and the ark and all that had become a very superstitious relics and almost worshipped by, by the people. But the Levitical system was all in place, not for an end in itself, but to be a giant object lesson, and even the Old Testament believers and these in our Lord's hearing should have been offering them by faith, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. But largely they were not. It had been lost on them. It was just the religious ritual they were going through. We eat this, we don't eat that, we offer this and we offer that. And, we, and they were thinking that because of this blood was being shed of the animals on the altar, was for taking away their sin. It never was given to take away their sin. It could not. When you study the book of Hebrews, the New Testament commentary on the Old Testament and Levitical system, you read, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, and we see there this in, uh, emphasis that the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, would come and once and for all end the Levitical system. There in verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 9, but unto the second went the high priest alone. He's talking about the Holy of Holies. Once every year, not without blood, which he offered first for himself and for the errors of the people, the sins of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, referring again to the coming of Christ, was not made fully clear. While as yet the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure, it was a picture, it was an object lesson for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. Plainly says, those sacrifices could not make the priest clear or clean or saved as pertaining to the conscience. Look down in chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow, a picture, a foreshadowing of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never, underline it, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers therein too perfect. Those sacrifices never cleared them of blame, never forgave them of their sin. It covered them if they offered them by faith. Had they not offered them by faith in the coming of the Messiah, they absolutely, it was nothing but a, regular, a religious ritual, like so many things that people do in church today. They don't look to the Christ alone, but they're coming to church, they're taking the Mass or taking the communion, going through a religious ritual and, ritual, and depending on that, their membership or their affiliation or they're doing certain things or not doing other things as salvation. Verse 2 asks the question, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? If it made them perfect, why would they keep on offering them? If those sacrifices could forgive sin, why were they keeping on doing it? Why were they 
continually. Every day there was smoke ascending from the temple. Every day the incense did not see. The meal offerings, the peace offerings, the drink offerings, the blood offerings continually were offered. If they ever could take away sins, why were you keeping on offering them? The fact that they had to continue to come shows it was a picture, it was a type for the offering that would come, the once and for all offering, which would be Messiah. Why were they, why weren't they ceased to be offered? Verse 2 says, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But they did. They went home, conscience still burdened, no relief, no peace. And so they came back the next day and come back the next ceremony, the next uh, feast day. But in those sacrifices, verse 3, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Thus the Passover, thus the Day of Atonement. For it is not possible, verse 4 tells us. Oh, we must underline and underscore. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. What a definitive statement. It was not possible. They were not given to take away sins. They were given, much as our memorial meal reminds us of what Christ did, this reminded them of what he would do. And they look forward to it by, by faith. It's not possible that the blood of animals, no matter how uh, pure and spotless they were to be in a perfect example, they could never take away sins. Verse 9 of chapter 10 of Hebrews, Then said he, this is Messiah, the second member of the Godhead, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. What was his will? To, to, to drink the bitter cup, every bit of it, to die in our place, to be a, a offer himself in our place. He taketh away the first, the first t testament, to establish the second, the second testament. The testament of salvation by grace through faith. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What? Once for all. Ending them all. Ending all the sacrifices. And every priest standeth daily ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which, and he repeats it, can never take away sins. But this man, referring to Jesus, the Messiah, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, did something the high priest in the Old Testament never, ever could do. Our Lord and Savior, the supreme sacrifice, who was not only the priest, the high priest, but he was the sacrifice in, in one. What did he do? He sat down. Do you know that the Old Testament priest had bells sewn on the hem of his garment. They rang, chink, tinkled constantly. The whole time he was in the Holy of Holies, which was shut off, they couldn't see what he was doing in there. They couldn't see the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't have a window in the side to watch what was going on. He had a rope tied to his waist or his ankle that went all the way outside. Do you know why? Because if he violated or did anything that was not according to the, the specified scripture, God would strike him dead. Remember Uzzah? He reached out and touched the ark. And so because of that, they were in great fear that, that the priest could theoretically mess up and he would die. And nobody could go in there to get him. So they would have to drag him out. There was no chair in the Holy of Holies. He could not have sat down even if he got wore out and tired midway through. But our Savior, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, after he had finished and cried out, it is finished and died and rose again, what did he do? He rose to heaven and did what? He sits down in the most majestic, honored place in all the universe, the right hand of God the Father. There he sits, our advocate, our Savior, making intercession for us, showing his wounds for his purchased possession. He's building his bride, the church. There he offers his and reminds when Satan comes to accuse, oh, no, no, no. We sing that beautiful song of Wesley, arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fear. The bleeding sacrifice in my defense appears. He shows his wounded hands 
And Father, Abba, Father, cry, we can cry. Well, he sat down and he's sitting there today until the Father says, gives him the word and he'll come for his own. Keep in mind that they were going up to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. On the way, our Lord pauses and informs his disciples of these very things. The very event which pointed to the great work that he was born to accomplish, the payment of our sins and our salvation. They shall mock him, they shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Praise the Lord for the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.